الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي All praise is due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى My respected brothers and sisters I was asked to share with you some thoughts about building alliances and someone asked me this question is this Islamic? Can we work with other people who are different than us? Where is the justification in Islam? Has the Prophet وسلم, ever did that? Can we as Muslims work with non-Muslims? And what are the boundaries? And to answer this question, I would like to remind myself and you to go to the main two sources, the Quran and the Hadith and the Seerah of the Prophet And I will spend considerable time to establish for this, to make sure that there is no doubt that when we act, we act based on our faith and our conviction, not on our convenience or what they say today, politics. So is working with other people just a matter of convenience? Because we have to, we need to do it now, but we did not do it. Is working with other people new to the Muslim community? It could be new to some Muslims, but it is not new to the early Muslims. It is not alien to Islam. And let me tell you where I'm coming from. I'm coming from the fact that the Quran has stated who we are in relations to other people that I believe it's missing from other platforms, whether sometimes religious, ideological, or political platforms. Muslims, as the, mashallah, the eloquent two speakers before me have stated, Muslims are blessed to be Muslim, to have this religion, but this religion has been unjustly mistreated and portrayed by the media, by Hollywood, by politicians, but also by Muslims. Who are these Muslims? Are the silent Muslims, the inactive Muslims, the Muslims who do not understand their own deen, the Muslims who are being seen as a dead weight over the, re the religion itself. So, to the point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the famous ayah, that we recite in many interfaith dialogues when we try to show how Islam deals with diversity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. The brother just recited that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Muslims, the Muslim community, the believers are the best community that was ever brought up or brought out to mankind. Some scholars in Arabic said, we are Ummat al khuruj we are an outgoing nation. We are not only for ourselves, for ourselves, but we are for humanity. We are not just an isolated, narrow-minded, tunnel vision community or people, but we are open-minded because we are here to deal with people, we are here to help the entire humanity. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even before that, he gave us a broader definition of who we are in relations to other people. When he said in the famous ayah, O oh mankind, we have created you from a single male and female. Ya ayyuha nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakri wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila lita'arafu inna akramakum indallahi atqakum inna allaha alimun khabir. O oh mankind, we have created you from a single male and female and we made you into nations and tribes so that you know one another. The most honorable of you in the sight of God is the most righteous and Allah is all knowing, all hearing. When it comes to recognizing that we are created differently, different sizes, different colors, different shapes, different backgrounds, different tongues, it is for a divine reason. 
that we should recognize that that this is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Allah has decreed. And if people don't like that, if they're angry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they don't like that, then the problem is within themselves, not with those created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the problem of Iblis. When Iblis was asked, along, along with other jinn, to prostrate as a form of obedience to Allah, and submission to Allah to prostrate for Adam and he defied the order he rejected and he said I am better than him that is the the superiority complex of Iblis that has transcended over generations even to mankind when people fail to appreciate one another when people fail to respect one another when people fail to understand and leverage the diversity humanity failed and many of the wars throughout mankind's history were due to the fact that people do not appreciate one another. Slavery is one. The war in Rwanda is one. The many World War I, World War II, and many ethnic strifes and conflicts and wars that killed millions of people were due to the fact that people failed to appreciate one another. And in Islam, we don't just accept diversity. We don't tolerate diversity, but we believe in diversity. It is a matter of faith. It is a matter of our aqidah. We cannot just tolerate people, which means they are a problem, but yeah, we will accept them. That is not Islamic. They are your brothers and sisters in humanity. The Quran is telling us we are a bigger family of nations and tribes that we should leverage each other's knowledge, experience, point of view, perspective, whether we disagree or agree. Most of the time we disagree, but we should respect that and we should believe it as a healthy sign. And that's why Islam welcomes all mankind. And that's why the social justice in Islam is so deep, so divine, so believed and should be so practiced. It is not a matter of convenience, it is a matter of conviction. And we as a Muslim community, therefore, when we act, we are faith-based and justice-driven. We will not tolerate any injustice. We will speak against it. We will stand against it. We will fight against it. We will not tolerate it. We will not coexist with it. We will not co be complacent. We will take a stand and we will show up and we'll push back. Now, how did this apply during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was brought up as a simple man not super a human being, simple man, an orphan who lost his mother and father, who suffered at an early age and knew the meaning of life, the meaning of loss. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, discovered life the hard way and he worked for it and he was taught the genuine basic meanings of decency, dignity, honesty, truthfulness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was preparing him through these trials and tests to be the leader, not only of the Muslim ummah, but the world. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at an early age had the experience of reflecting and pondering upon the creation. When he was given the opportunity, he depended on himself. And he worked in so many small professions, into business, to the point that he was recognized as a sadiq the truthful, and al-ameen, the trustworthy, the trustworthy. When that commodity was rare in his time, he was distinguished with his moral character. 
So Khadija, one of the main businesswomen of her time, knew about his reputation, and she wanted to give him a job. And she hired him to be a business delegate for her. And he took many trips from Mecca to, to Asham, to Syria, Jordan, Palestine. And they reported back to her, to Khadija, that when Muhammad, وسلم, the young businessman, when he was presented with an opportunity to cheat, to cut around the deals, he did not. He was honest. When it was convenient for him to say something he should not say, he remained truthful. He resisted the temptation and corruption of business deals. When it was reported to her, he was different than many people she hired before. And she decided to seek his partnership in marriage. That is our model and role model, brothers and sisters. When he became a prophet, when he was declared to be a prophet, all this reputation was thrown out the door by his opponents. And Quraysh escalated the oppression and pressure and boycott and physical harm on him and his companions. So he started to look for friends. He did not find many. Where did this alliance idea came from? The Prophet ﷺ wanted to protect his community, his very few followers, and he decided to seek protection for them. He worked around, he did not find any refuge for them in and around Mecca. But also he was aware of what's going on, potential allies in the world. And he thought of a distant ally in Abyssinia. He was aware of the world affairs of his time. He knew who was just and who was not. And he sought protection to send a delegation to an area under the rule of a king where he does not share belief with. He does not share the, the same faith. But the Prophet ﷺ knew that the king of, uh, king of Abyssinia shares with the Prophet and his small community the values of decency that believe in God. That belief is not solid because Christians then had their own belief different than Muslims. So there were serious faith differences between Muslims and Christians. But the Prophet ﷺ put the interests of the community and his companions over some of these differences because he has to take a stance. He wanted to protect the bigger interests of the community. And he entrusted to send 72, the majority of his companions, to Abyssinia, to a foreign land. But he knew that they will enjoy, they will enjoy freedom of religion and protection under the king. That is one of the first practical alliance building and benefiting the relation from the relationship between people who we disagree with for the interests of the Muslim community, brothers and sisters. But in doing so, the Prophet ﷺ sent a spokesman for potential problem. He appointed Ja'far bin Abi Talib, a sophisticated negotiator and debater. Why? Because once Quraysh discovered that the Muslims escaped from their control into Abyssinia, they were not just silent. They tried to sabotage this, this migration. And they sent behind them Amr bin al-As, who was another shrewd debater and planner. He went there and followed them and met with the king. And he said, these people do not believe in your belief. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe that he is God. These people are rebels. They rebelled against our system in Mecca. 
They have to be punished. We need them back. Then Ja'far bin Abi Talib decided to strike. The message that we have common interest. Yes, we don't believe that Jesus is God, but our community is oppressive. Our community is abusive. Our community oppresses the poor, oppresses the poor. And we honor Jesus. We honor Mary. And he recited the ayat. He chose the right message in the right time for the right people. With, with people, we do not share all the beliefs, but we shared common interests, brothers and sisters. Where did this come from? How this small community in Mecca, minority, isolated, oppressed, where do they come up with this psychology of relationships? I'll take you to Surat Ar-Rum. When you go home, read Surat Ar-Rum. Surat Ar-Rum was revealed in Mecca when the Muslim community was a small, oppressed community. Allah says in the Quran, Alif Lam Mim in Surat Ar-Rum. Alif Lam Mim, غُلِبَتُ الرُّومُ فِي أَدْنَى الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ Alif Lam Mim, the Byzantines were defeated in the near land. And they, after their defeat, will be victorious in a few years. That was a revelation. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers and sisters, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about this issue in Mecca? When we know that the Meccan era was only focused on aqidah, tawheed, the oneness of Allah, why did the Quran talk about world affairs? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about World War I then between the Byzantines and the Romans? Because the Romans and the Byzantines were the superpower of the time. The Romans, I'm sorry, the, the, the Persians and the Romans, the Romans were Byzantines, were closer to the Muslim community than the Persians who used to worship fire. They are closer to the Muslim community because they are people of the book. And the Quran wanted people, while being a minority, not to be only thinking about themselves and their suffering and their conditions, but also to be engaged with the world affairs, to know what's going on in the world stage. This is the hikmah and the wisdom of the, those ayat in Mecca to bring and prepare this community to play a major role in the future on the world stage. And this is critical for the making of the Muslim psyche and plan and how we relate to other people. So the Prophet وسلم, as he was moving forward, you have to learn more about his moral character, his personality. The Prophet وسلم, was sophisticated in understanding how people feel. He was very compassionate. He cared about other people. He was a community activist. He was engaged in what was going on in the communities around him. He never isolated himself because he's a mercy to mankind. You cannot be a mercy to mankind if you are not engaged with people. How can you be a mercy to mankind unless you are engaged you understand their issues, you feel for them, you work for them, and you care about them. That's how we Muslims should be. We don't only care about ourselves and our, about, about our community's affairs. Fast forward, when the Prophet وسلم, after he moved to Medina and established the first Muslim civil society in Medina, he also realized that there are many components in the society. There, are, there were Christians, there were Jews, there were atheists, there were pagans in Medina. But also Quraysh did not let her hostility. They wanted to crack down and besiege Medina. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? He signed a common defense treaty 
with the components of the society, not only for the protection of Muslims, but for the protection of everyone in the community, in the Medina. So they were Christians, they were Jews, they were pagans, they all signed common defense treaty. And that is, was complex alliance that we can work together for the common good. We don't share the same belief like you. We don't have to agree with you on everything. But when there is an imminent danger against our communities, against our society, we have to act together. We care for one another. And we will show solidarity with one another. And we will defend each other. That's how the Prophet wasallam. That's how we built. He built strategic, social, and political alliances with other people. For those who's a, who are asking, where is the Islamic principles and justification for working with other people, I say, go back to the roots of Islam. Learn about the Prophet wasallam. With limited means and more pressure and challenges around him, he was the most sophisticated negotiator. He never compromised his faith, but he never confused faith with public affairs. A case in point, he struck a deal with Quraysh, with the delegation of Quraysh, in one of these peace negotiations. And they agreed to write a peace treaty. So the Prophet dictated on the, on the writer to say, write, this agreement is between Muhammad, the Prophet, of God and Quraysh. The Quraysh representative said, no, we don't recognize you as a prophet of God, and that's why we're fighting you. If you are the prophet of God in our views, we would not have fought you. So the Sahaba, the companions, felt that this, was, this guy was very disrespectful, and he's crossing the line, and they were willing and able to take care of business. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? Look, statesman, strategic, and he was trying to negotiate peace. He said, and I paraphrase, that's the point, strike it down. Take it down. Don't write Muhammad Rasulullah, the Prophet of God. Write it, this agreement is between Muhammad and the delegation. The Prophet never sold out Islam. He never compromised his faith. But he looked at the general interest of the community and the society to achieve peace. We have to learn from this example, brothers and sisters. Today, we live as a minority. But we should not act as a minority. We have been victimized by the injustice, but we should not act as victims. We should act as victors. We should work with other people. In the past few years, many of us in the Muslim community did not work with other communities, other communities of color, minorities. And yes, I can, and I can understand, but there is no excuse for us now that for the past three years, things have been very clear. I don't say easy, but they have been made very clear by the occupant of 16 Pennsylvania Avenue, namely Trump. Things have been made very clear that bigotry and, and fear has been used to, defy, to divide Americans. And unfortunately, it worked. When other minorities did not work together before, they lost control over their destiny. And they allowed fear and bigotry to dominate the the discourse and conversation and debates. And yes, fear won in 2016 in the United States. Because many of us thought we can do it alone. No one can do it alone in this country or anywhere. We have to work with everyone in our society. We have to work with other communities. And we cannot be selfish as Muslims. We, if we are Muslims, we have to care about other minorities, especially African-Americans.
They have been oppressed for hundreds of years, and they continue to be oppressed, and they are part of our community. Latinos, they have been attacked by this president, and they have been named and called every name, and we should show support for them and solidarity unconditionally. We have to care about the economic equity and or inequality in this country. We have to push for equal pay for equal work. These are Islamic issues. They're not just non-Muslim issues. Black Lives Matter is a movement that we should all embrace because racial profiling is a disease in our society and African Americans cannot do it alone. They need us and we need them. We need to work together. Brothers and sisters, it has shown that in the past three years, we have many common issues in our society. Yes, the closest issues to us is Islamophobia and the Muslim ban. But look, who stood up to the first executive order by President Trump? The majority of Muslims did not react. The majority of people who are not Muslims rushed to the airports and declared we are all Muslim and to protest the racist policy by President Trump. To me, I'm grateful to see all these Americans who do not share with me and you our belief, but they share with us the value that we are all equal and we should be treated equally and there should be no racist, racist policy allowed by this president or any other president. And today, I will remind myself and all of you, what you see today from political attacks on the Muslim community, and specifically on the fresh and needed voices of Congress people like Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, these have been targeted. But Ilhan Omar specifically has been targeted, and Rashida Tlaib, not just because they, of their political positioning, but because they represent something. They spoke truth to power. For many years, we have been complaining about many injustices. Now you have voices in Congress representing their own districts, but they happen to be Muslim that we are proud of. They're willing to correct the wrong and speak truth to power. And they have broken many taboos. And they have the courage to stand up and say what they believe. Because people send them from their districts to Washington, D.C., as Ilhan Omar said, not to be quiet, but to do the business of the people. Unfortunately, and I have to say this, Islamophobia is not only dominant within the GOP, but Islamophobia is also dominant within the Democratic Party. And we as Muslims, we should not take anyone for granted. And they should not take our votes for granted. We should vote our issues and our principles. And no one should believe that because the Muslim community has given its support to one party that our votes are granted just because we don't speak out. We cannot continue to do business as usual. Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and others are being targeted because this president and others are not used to see a woman of color, a Muslim woman with hijab, black, to stand up for her rights and for the rights of all of us. They're not used to it. And some people call me and ask me if I know Ilhan or I know Rashid Atlib to ask him to slow down, to be cool. I say no. Let them do their business and they should not slow down. Muslims in America should catch up with Ilhan Omar and Rashid Atlib. And you should support them. I know that I'm speaking at a religious platform and I speak usually for care, but at this moment, I speak in my personal capacity. I say, don't wait 
for Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib to be defeated. Work with them now, open your checks, and organize politically and mobilize the community. And we do not want them to be the only two Muslim women in Congress. You plan to run for Congress yourself in the city council, in your areas. Organize, vote, register to vote, and be active, be visible. We should not depend only on two people. We also should depend on ourselves. And this is just the beginning for the Muslim community, brothers and sisters. There are many issues that we should care about. The environment and climate change. This is an issue that we care about. And let me take you back to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cared about the environment. Because we are entrusted with this planet, with this earth. And we cannot be destructive to ourselves or to the planet. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said in a beautiful hadith, and nasu shuraka'a fi al-ma'i wal kala'i wal nar he said that 1400 years ago. He said, people are partners in water, in food, and fire. Today, it means energy, sources of energy. We Muslims have to be on the forefront of innovation, of reform, and be the leaders to advocate for the protection of this planet because we believe in science. We believe in science. Yes, many of us are conservatives, but we should not equate conservatism with not believing in science. We can be conservative, but we also believe in science, and we have a duty to protect the environment and work with others. And this is a Muslim agenda and should be something that we care about. Brothers and sisters, the immigration issues is also of value and importance to us. We should not only stand up for those migrants and immigrants if they happen to be from our community. We should stand up for the DACA recipients and DACA dreamers. And yes, if you can express any solidarity, any support for their issues, do that in many ways. Some of us took civil disobedience and we resisted arrest, and we took some of these steps to just to express our support for this issue. But we can do also more. We can do litigation. We can do advocacy. We can speak to our members of Congress. They should hear from us. Mosques should be organized and should organize the community to raise awareness about all of these issues and host debates and town hall meetings to raise awareness and to mobilize the Muslim community for social justice. The mosques should not be rest areas and only places of worship, but they should be places for mobilization and activism and pushing forward for the betterment of this country and the betterment of our community and the society. To conclude, brothers and sisters, I am very hopeful like all of you, that inshallah things will get better. And this is just a new era for the Muslim community. Because of these vicious Islamophobic attacks that have been escalating in the past three years, we have been forced to be in the front line. And we, or some of us, have been resisting to be active. And some of us have been forced to be active, to be visible. That should not be the case. It is the turn of the Muslim community that we are where we are now. We owe it to our faith. And we owe it to our children. If you don't want to live as a second-class citizen, you should do all you can to stand up for your rights, not to compromise your civil or human rights if they are tampered on. Because second-class citizenship is not an option for Muslims in America today or ever, inshallah. 
Second class citizenship should not be an option for us or our children or our grandchildren. Second class citizenship should not be an option for every Muslim or non-Muslim in this country. But to secure that this will not be the case, we really have to roll up our sleeves and work together with other communities and strategically spend our time and resources where it matters. It matters for us to be more politically engaged. It matters to put our eyes on the prize and wait, not for something to happen, but to make things happen in the 2020 elections. My final reminder to myself and advice to all of you is for those who did not vote in the 2016 elections, you know what happened and we see the results. May Allah forgive me and forgive you if you did not vote. 2020 is around the corner. Register to vote. Register at least five people from your friends and families to vote. On the day of the election, make sure that you vote and ensure that five people from your circles of friends and family make sure that they vote. Because every vote counts. When some of us were discouraged in 2016 because of some political choices, and stayed at home, we saw the results. We paid the price for two and a half years and three years of attacks, relentless attacks on the Muslim community and other minorities. Us and other minorities, we have lost the battle. We've lost the battle in 2016. But in the past two years, when we started to work together, when we built coalitions on common good, when we agreed to ag disagree but work together, the minorities work together and they won the House of the U.S. Congress. And they should control, they should keep that control, but they should not lose it. But also the Senate is waiting for all of us to work on. And also the presidential election, it's not for gun. Brothers and sisters, to conclude, if someone like President Trump, who has no values, no principles, no experience in politics or legislation. If he managed to lobby, to organize, to campaign and run for this and win the presidency of the United States, I assure you that if any one of you runs for any office in the land, you can win. And you should consider yourself as a potential candidate for any office. And don't wait for just the powerful people to lead us. We can lead because we are no less equal than anyone else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and make us worthy of his help and victory. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.